Thank you, Jesus. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to all the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John said to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who are who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him even so amen i am the alpha and the omega says the lord god who is and who was and who is to come the almighty the reading of the word. Father, we love you. We love you. We thank you for this gift, this book, this letter, this God-breathed uh, inspiration to the church. Lord, we receive these words with humility of heart. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that we would not necessarily study the scriptures today, but that your scriptures would study us. I ask, Lord, that as you are lifted up, that you would draw all men unto yourself. I ask that the character and nature of Father God would be understood and experienced. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would so haunt us in this place. I ask that the Holy Spirit would reveal Jesus. I ask that the Holy Spirit would convict us of sin. I ask that the Holy Spirit would bring our bodies into the blueprint of heaven, would bring our minds into the blueprint of heaven, which is the blueprint of shalom, peace, prosperity, that things would function the way that you always created them to function. We declare you are our shepherd and we are the sheep of your pasture. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll do some review and so we'll begin in verse 1, uh, which really tackles the purpose of this book, this, this letter. It begins with the revelation of Jesus the Christ. Just say Jesus. Okay, um, we will keep Jesus before us. He will be the key. He will be the way that we uh, understand what is happening in this text. And if we get confused, we'll just come back to him. We'll just come back to Jesus. It says that this is the, the apocalypse, the unveiling. Okay, and this book exists to make known, to manifest the secrets that are hidden to the world that can only be revealed by the Holy Spirit through this book. Okay? And so um, this is not just a book. This is God's word. This is his unchanging sword. Okay? And it says the revelation, the revealing, the intimate unveiling. This is a letter between a bridegroom and his bride on the wedding night. This is not for the pagans. They wouldn't have understood what was being said. This is for a people intimately aware with the Old Testament and the words that were written. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants. Just say servants. Okay. Uh, that's the audience there. Um, that word servants can be translated as 
slaves or bond servants. Okay? It's kind of an, an offensive word within our culture that has a context for slavery that really isn't all that old. Okay? When we hear uh, slaves, it's somewhat of a triggering word, and yet um, in this time, in the first century, it's almost as if everybody was a slave to someone. I mean, even within the Roman context, okay, we don't see ourselves as like a slave to Biden, although some days feels like you guys see everything out, you know, that happened this week with the property taxes and all that. All right, all right, all right, all right. Stay focused. See, this is what I'm saying. Where's Jesus at? All right. But certainly there would have been this understanding of being like a slave to Caesar. And in the same way that when you became a Christian, okay, this idea of, of a religion as a hobby just wouldn't have worked during this period of time. Um, to give your life to Christ would literally mean to be a slave to his service, to be a bond servant, to be a, a, it, would be, it would mean the end of your preferences, the end of your, um, even your affairs, that to give your life to Jesus uh, meant that you were probably most likely going to actually give your life for Jesus, right? And like these days we're like, have you given your life to Jesus? Uh, in this context, it was like you believed in him at breakfast time and then your life was being taken from you by dinner time. In fact, even the word witness, okay, is synonymous with martyr. So uh, we have here the early church facing gruesome deaths for those who had refused to renounce their faith. Okay, uh, imprisonment and torture was common. Okay, uh, forms of torture for the church include flogging. Okay, uh, even like the cat of nine tails, like what Jesus uh, went through. Torture, mutilation, um, uh, imprisonment in dark, cramped cells in dungeons. It meant you were most likely going to lose your job. You couldn't belong to the, to the uh, various guilds and, and uh, Roman unions um, at that time. It meant the destruction of your property. Uh, Christian meeting places, okay, uh, such as houses, were, were targeted by the authorities. And forced apostasy. This is that place where um, the church believers, members, would be tortured until they recanted their faith, which Motes um, did not do. Um, the church uh, was in this place of tremendous um, persecution. And we see that this letter is written to them, to the servants. Okay? And we see it speaks of the things that must soon take place. Speaking of this, the church is in a massive transition. Uh, 2,000 years ago, not, not, 2000, not, not now and not to come, okay? This is a letter written to them for us. And we can't impose anything on the text that would not have been understood and received 2,000 years ago. Here is a church in tremendous persecution, and we know that this letter is going to be bread for them. This book is going to sustain them. It's going to let them know of the things that are about to take place even in their own generation. And it says here, he made it known by sending his angel, okay, to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he, okay, made it known for the purpose of revealing Jesus Christ, okay? So who's he? He here is the Father. So here we have the Father who makes it known by his messenger, Okay, and who's the messenger? The messenger is the paraclete, it's the helper, it's Holy Spirit. So here you have the Father and Holy Spirit, okay, working together to reveal the majesty of Yeshua, King Jesus. All right, this is what the, the church fathers would call the greeting from the Trinity. This is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit doing what they do best, 
working together to do something amazing. All right. Now it says here, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and blessed are those who keep what is written for the time is near. The early church is saying, um, this, is, this is what they're hearing. You're, you're receiving this book. You're receiving this letter. You will be blessed upon hearing it. But that's not enough. Hear the word. Receive the word. Read the word out loud and practice the word, okay? Live the word, okay? And if you do this, this word will sustain you. There are some things that are coming. This word will keep you if you receive the bread, bring the bread into you, let the bread explode from within you and live the bread. Be fueled by this bread, this certainly applies to us, okay? This book, this revelation, okay? Not revelations. The book of revelation, the re revelation of Jesus is given to this specific church, but it's given for us globally within the church of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means read the word, receive the word, eat the word like bread, let it come into you, let it explode, let it ignite, let it fuel you so that you can do what? So that you can live the word. Is that good? This thing isn't just for your mind. It is for your mind. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Thank you, Jesus, for my mind, okay? You know, we shouldn't say things like, I think I'm losing my mind, right? Like we say a lot of things about our mind, okay? Uh, even in our stream, we're like, the mind is the enemy of the Holy Spirit and logic is this. And you know, Bless your mind. Okay, bless your brain, okay? Um, don't ever forget, okay, that God has given you a brain. Isn't that good? So many times something happens, and the first thing we do is, you know, we, we go here, we go there, we pop a pill, we smoke this, okay? Uh, don't forget, okay, that God has given you a brain, but that's not all he's given you. He's given you a heart. He's given you a spirit. He's given you his spirit. Isn't that good? So, be blessed. Bless yourself. Is that good? Let me just, because that, that's for somebody. You're not losing your mind. And, it, and if you said that, I want you to say this right now. I want my mind back in Jesus' name. Just declare this with me. Satan, you can't have my mind. Hallelujah. This is why we put on the, the helmet of salvation. So we don't believe every little thought. And we don't trust every little feeling. Okay, why'd you do that? Well, I, I was feeling this, right? Don't be lorded over by your feelings, okay? Our faith in Christ, okay? That, that'll provide the bedrock that we need uh, to, uh, to stand. Verse four, John to the, I'm sorry, John to the seven churches uh, that are in Asia, okay? Uh, when, when John speaks of Asia, this is the Roman province of Western uh, Asia Minor, where Christianity was flourishing by the end of the first century. Um, we talk about this part of Asia Minor, this Roman province, all right? Um, this is where modern-day Western Turkey would be located. Uh, we, will get, we will do maps, okay? We'll do some maps, right? We'll do some, do some charts. It'll be good, right? Um, but, if, if, but I want you just to use your imagination uh, just for, for today, if you will, and I want you to see um, the Aegean Sea, beautiful turquoise, beautiful sea, all right? You have uh, Patmos, okay, at the very bottom here, right? And then you've got a, a boat ride from Patmos to Ephesus, okay? Uh, Ephesus is this uh, hub of activity and life and urban influence. It's Hollywood, Washington, D.C., okay, um, and New York, all in, all in one epicenter of commerce and trade and and, uh, and, and all that good, fun stuff, all right? That's where all the influencers are, Ephesus, okay? All right, and so then you go from Ephesus up to 40 or 50 miles. Each of these locations are separated by about 40 or 50 miles. So we go from Ephesus up to Smyrna, okay? Um, and from uh, Smyrna um, up to uh, Thyatira. How am I doing? I left my phone at the back, so I'm just doing all this by, by memory. Um, uh, can somebody roll me my phone? Or Josh, you want to put it up? I did it in the service perfectly, but you guys are making me nervous. 
I was going to put Thyatira at the top. Thanks, Josh. Josh Park. Oh, I was off. I'm glad I double-checked. All right, so Patmos to Ephesus, Ephesus to Smyrna, Smyrna up to Pergamon, Pergamum over to Thyatira, Thyatira to Sardis, Sardis to Philadelphia, Philadelphia to Laodicea. Okay, so seven literal churches separated equally about 40 uh, to 50 miles, and each of these churches are experiencing revival. This is signs, wonders, miracles, multiplication. Okay? And you can read about this in church history. All right? And yet at the same time, they're about to get a letter from a messenger of John. This wouldn't be John transcribing seven different letters. This is one letter. Okay? Uh, this is the book uh, that the Lord has given to him. And a messenger would go from Patmos to Ephesus and visit each of the churches. And you can bet as they would do this, they would transcribe the book of Revelation um, and they would transcribe these letters to the churches. In fact, the revival is so awesome. And God was doing so much that it is recorded, okay, uh, in, in church history that many of the pagan uh, temples, okay, were, uh, were shutting down and being evacuated. The peop people were li literally turning from their paganism in record numbers. And keep, 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 keep in mind that this, that this movement is, is illegal and considered subversive by both the religious authorities, okay, and the governmental authorities. So um, it doesn't make sense. Um, how can something be so popular if it would cost you your life? Okay? And so, uh, here, now, a lot of us would say, well, there, there's going to be some difficult things that the Lord has to say to this church. And how could it be that you have the supernatural, signs, wonders, miracles, resurrections from the dead? Um, how could it be that you have this kind of apostolic authority established in seven different cities and yet they're going to be rebuked by the Lord um, because this is what a kind father does. A kind father disciplines his sons. A kind father disciplines those who he loves. And first of all, it's a word of warning. And it's saying, listen, uh, you've been under persecution, but it's, it's going to get worse. And so there is prophetic warning to the church. Um, you, it, it's been kind of bad, and yet it's, it's about to get worse. And there's also a exhortation to the church of, hey, listen, uh, um, you need to return back to um, uh, the purity of your worship, and you must turn away from the cultural compromise that exist to strangle out the purity of this move and that is coming to turn this move into something else that it was never intended to be. There is a, there's a battle for this revival. There is a battle for this missional movement. And, and the Lord is saying, I am unwilling. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to prepare. You're, you're going to see the things that are to come and to come actually quite, quite soon. Okay, um, but this book, ex it exists to prepare you, to encourage you, to inspire you, and to bring you back to me. That, this is why the book of Revelations exists. Um, there was a, 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 an awesome young person that I got to meet in the hallway uh, last week. I don't know if she's here in the service. And I asked her if she had ever studied the book of Revelation before. And she said uh, that she had a little bit, um, but that she had avoided it because it was too scary. And I think that a lot of us can relate with that um, because uh, there has been teaching on the book of Revelation where people imposed their own fear, shame, and control on the text. So because they imposed their fear on a text, the text was used to shame people into performance, into performance-based holiness, which, my friends, is no holiness at all. But as we begin to read the book of Revelation, who it's to, what it's for, I'm telling you this, okay? Uh, the book of Revelation will inspire you. It'll motivate you. And it will give you a tremendous courage and a tremendous zeal to get this good news out, to export 
the good news of the gospel. And this is what I believe the Lord's going to do with this series. I think that the, the Lord is going to use this series not to get us to buy property out in, out in Nevada or, 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 or Smoky Point. <laughs> you know, can I tell you something that's so funny? Um, during, uh, how many of you remember Y2K? Does that, does, it, does that date me? Okay. The end of the world, remember? The year 2000. And this is actually really funny. Uh, there were people at that time that were using the book of Revelation as the textbook to say you got to get out of any urban centers. And we had a family that they left the church here to move to all places, the very same place where Elon Musk is building seven factories. Point being, the sticks ain't the sticks anymore. Right? So there you have your bunker, okay? <laughs> With your top rumen and Bud Light, right? <laughs> you're, all, you're all ready for the, the apocalypse. Okay? And then Disney comes in and puts a theme park. <laughs> you guys uh, are going to need to stay more focused. All right, so <laughs> here we have <laughs> the letter saying, okay, this letter exists, church, to encourage you, to let you know um, what is coming up, beginning with Ephesus. L talking to these Actual churches with actual issues, with actual um, opportunities, okay? Uh, and for this reason, I think, it's, I think it's okay to say this. I don't think that we can fairly impose seven church ages onto this text. How many of you ever seen that? You see the church ages and the, and the charts that say and that once the church goes through seven church ages, okay, then the rapture will take place. And so this is a, um, a, a, you know, a popular teaching back, uh, originated more in the early 1900s, but was not shared by the church fathers, okay? It was not uh, something that would have been understood uh, by these, even these seven churches, they read this letter, okay? The early church read this letter not saying in 2,000 years from now, this is what will take place. Uh, when the early church read this book, they said there are massive changes that are taking place in our generation. There are things that are coming to an end and there are things that are beginning. And this book lines up with church history. They were absolutely right. The book of Revelation was not written Okay, uh, to America. It was written to these seven churches. Seven being important in that seven is fulfillment. Okay, seven is completion. There's going to be a lot of sevens. As we're doing this study, we're going to see sevens everywhere. In fact, uh, you're going to be driving down the road and you're going to see seven here and seven there. Okay, um, and what is that completion? Yep, uh, this letter is being given to these seven literal churches, but they are, these are, influencer cities and this revelation is going to go out from each of these hubs here we have seven influencing hubs that is going to influence the christian church in the known world okay when we say that this book is for us what does that mean it means that this book is for the completed the whole the universal church okay not speaking of the universal church where even the uh you know hindus and mormons get to play Okay, uh, uh, and that's, it gets complicated. Let's just say, you know, Church of Jesus Christ, right? Is that good? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, I'm glad we had this conversation. Let's keep reading. Verse four. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. And Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of the kings of the earth. This is awesome. Grace and peace be uh, uh, to you um, from him who is, okay, the embodiment of these seven spirits. This is a, um, a direct link, okay, and this is Revelation for you. Revelation is the book of portals. It is the book of gateways and passages that are always leading us back to the Old Testament. So when you get right here, okay, the Jewish readers would hear this and say, this is the book of Isaiah. This is the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 11, okay, um, verses 1 to 3. 
talking about um, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Okay, what are we talking about? Okay, what are we talking about? A stump. We're talking about a tree. Okay, the, the, the empire of Solomon. Okay, the, the greatest, the greatest uh, time of, of reigning for, for Israel in a tree that is cut. Okay, and from this tree that was cut, what is this stump? This stump is Jesse, okay, the father of King David. Okay, but from this stump comes forth what looks like a weed. It, 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 it's called a shoot or a sucker. It's the word netzer. Are you ready for this? That's where we get the term Nazarite. What good could come from Nazareth? That from the great empire of Jesse, right, that is now just a stump, will come forth the son of David, Yeshua, the holy and an anointed one. The one who walks in, okay, the seven spirits of God, seven speaking of the spirit without measure. Seven speaking of his spirit in fullness. You hear seven, you hear fullness. And this is how symbology works. It's almost like you're reading a different language. What we don't have here, okay, are at, uh, within Jewish mysticism, within the Kabbalah, there would be the teaching of God taking his spirit and dividing it out among 10 different essences. And here you have 10 independent entities that are resembling uh, the essence of God, but function independently from the mind of God. And this is sometimes taught that here you have seven independent operators who are reflecting aspects of the character and nature of God, but are these seven angels, if you will, um, seven mentors. And they exist now, uh, and the reason why we're hitting on this is that this would be a popular teaching, okay? But usually terminates on more of the experiential theology. You would say, what's experiential theology? It's the belief in God that doesn't necessarily come from God's word, but comes from somebody's experience. And I'll tell you why it's, it's dangerous. It's because I can tell you this is truth because this is what I experienced. So then you elevate my experience above God's word. And then you begin to desire my experience. Okay, now let's just take, let's pick on one of these aspects of these seven spirits of God. Let's say might, okay, the, the power of God. Let's say that the might of God is an independent angel the might of god is an independent angel that exists apart from him you say well it was before before the throne so here you have set the seven spirits of god that are before the throne operating distinctively they reflect who he is but they are before him um, and this is where we have to remember that the glory of god is before him the glory of god is behind him the glory of god is all about him so this is where the book of revelation is going to um and I'm okay with doing this because we're still in our introduction. We can't get hung up on, on spatial details, okay? And we can't get hung up on time sequences. And the reason why is because as we're going through this, we're going to see these symbols that are taking us throughout the Old Testament, but we're going to be jumping a lot. We're going to be jumping to different books. We're going to be jumping to different places in time. Okay, now here we have the seven, seven spirits of God that are before him, but this is the spirit of the Lord. This was the spirit that was on Christ. Where did we get that? Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 frames this context. The context is the empire of Solomon cut down, okay, giving to us Jesus, okay, the shoot. Okay, coming up and then goes into the, the seven, the, full, the, the fullness is spirit without measure that would rest on Christ and rest on his body. Who is the body? Who, who is the body? 
Where is the body? Here. Yeah. So what does this mean? It means that in Christ, the anointed one, and why, why is this important? You don't need a new anointing. So don't seek a new anointing. Seek Christ. He is the smeared one, and in him you step into his spirit without measure. You with me? Yep. And so for this, you don't seek a new anointing from Darren. You seek Christ first. Seek first the king, his kingdom, and a part of the body, you'll receive the oil that comes from where? The head. Is that good? So what does that mean? It means you don't seek wisdom as an independent spirit outside of Christ. You don't speak, you don't, you don't even seek joy. Don't seek joy. Don't seek peace. Don't seek revelation. We are not into new revelation. Trust me on that. We are into the revelation of Christ. If it's outside of him, I don't need it. If it's him, I want all of it. I want more. I want more of you, Jesus, okay? More understanding of who he is. More understanding of what he has done. More understanding of what I'm able to operate in, in him. So uh, think about this for a second. We, the bride, okay, with the, uh, we might do it th tonight, the, the golden candlestick, the center candle, okay, being the spirit of the Lord, okay, and then branching off the spirit of wisdom and understanding, two parallel candles, the spirit of counsel and might, okay, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, okay, they are partners, they, they come together all within Christ, who he is, his anointing. Is that good? Verse 5, and from Jesus. Okay, isn't this amazing? It just keeps taking us back to Jesus. Just it keeps taking us back to him. And from Jesus, check it out, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Okay, um, Jesus who was and is and is to come. Okay, Go back into the beginning, the formation of all things. In the beginning was the word, the, the logos, that is Christ. In the beginning, when God said, let there be light, there was the dance, there was the trinity, there was the dream team, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is both lamb and priest. Okay, that... From David came Jesus. And yet from Jesus came David. Verse 5. And made us, fashioned us, formed us in, in his hands a kingdom, a priest to God and Father. Um, what is this speaking of? This is speaking of Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek. This is a different kind of breed. In fact, most of us don't really understand um, who Melchizedek was and where did he come from and what was he doing and he was so different and was he a king or was he a priest? Yes. Was he natural? Was he supernatural? Yes. And who is this order of Melchizedek? It is the body of Christ, a peculiar people a holy nation natural and supernatural terrestrial and extraterrestrial by the way we are the aliens that the media keeps warning everybody about <laughs> they should be afraid of us and not afraid of the seven foot tall face suckers okay the devil is afraid of the church of Jesus Christ. The battle for the earth is not between the grays and this soil. And, okay, the battle is between heaven and hell. The righteous and the profane. Okay? And it is a blazing. It is on, my friends. Okay. So we are a peculiar people. Okay? 
like the, like the earth has never seen before, okay, to him be the glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, for he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. It speaks of him coming on the clouds. This word can be translated a large, dense multitude. The early church fathers would have translated that here comes the return of King Jesus and he's not coming alone. He's coming with a dense, thick multitude of the resurrected of the dead. That here is the, the resurrection taking place as the living and the dead coming together, forming this massive cloud. We will read, we will study more of this in the days to come because of the various uh, translations um, Within the text, verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. You cannot place me in a place of time. You cannot put me in your space and time. You cannot figure me out. I am God. I am good. I am the one who is and was and is to come. This, my friends, the early church would, would read this and be hanging on to every word. Persecuted and knowing that more is coming and yet they would take the bread. They would eat the bread. The bread would come into them and they would say, this is who our God is. This is who our King is. I can do all things through Christ. I can live out Romans 12. I can outdo one another in showing honor. I can, I can let wrath be in the hands of God without having to pour out my, my fleshy wrath on others. I can trust God. I can live for God. We can do this because that is who he is. Because that is who he is. And we would see of uh, the tremendous atrocities and injustices that would take place in the years that would follow the first and second centuries and the massive persecution that would come at the church and, and nations. And I can tell you, um, you can chat with Pastor Masood who, who will be doing the teaching on the letter to the persecuted church. And he will tell you about Iran and he will tell you about the persecution on the church there. And, and, um, and we are rejoicing with Pastor Masood Sued and Sarah and, 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 and even just some of the recent atrocities against uh, some of the pastors uh, there and how the Lord has executed justice on their behalf, that the Lord is showing up. But I can tell you this, that when the church in Iran reads the book of Revelation, courage fills their hearts because it reminds them this is who God is. This is who Jesus is. This is the majesty of King Jesus. And meanwhile, you know, in America, right, our, 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 the battery on our cell phone dies. And so we throw the phone at the ground. We call it spiritual warfare. <laughs> call it the end times. Call it what you... I think the, the word to us prophetically is Church of America. We better read this word. We better understand this word. We better hear it. We better read it aloud. We better get it into us so that no matter what happens, we refuse to turn molehills into mountains. And that we remember no matter what crisis we face in our nation, no matter what crisis we face in the nations, he is the author and perfecter of our faith. That the only diagnosis that matters the only report that matters is what does God and his word have to say about this? The enemy will use whatever he can use to inject fear because if we will believe his lies, then he can steal from us. The only way the enemy can steal from you is if you believe his lies. There's a battle for our hope. And here we have the early church. They are losing their lives, their children, their job. But they would never lose their hope. On his word, on the foundation of his identity, they would stand and they would stand firm. And with that being said, what are you fighting against today? What is trying to lie to you? What is trying to, to rob your hope from you? What are they trying to tell you? That you're going to die? 
And where, where do you want to elevate that report, that, that status to? Let me, for those of you that, that have been given a negative report from your doctor, let me just re remind you, your doctor practices medicine. And your doctor did not create you. He did not form you in the womb. He has not counted your days. We love doctors. We bless. I'm not trying to curse doctors. If a, if a doctor gives you a report that's not consistent with the word of God, okay, I guess you can be nice to your doctor, but, but I, I wouldn't necessarily subscribe to that report. Declare, I, I'll, okay, I'll believe the report of the Lord. I'm, I'm going to renew my mind according to his word, according to who he says I am. I'm going to align my life with the finished work of the cross. That he did not just die for my sins. He died as my sins and my sickness and my disease. He took upon himself on the cross. And that is why they did not edit out the countless testimonies in God's word where blind eyes were opened where the crippled would begin to dance, where the mute tongue would, uh, just this last week, uh, I heard a report from our, our healing night on Tuesday nights about a boy that was mute and hadn't spoken in over a year. And as Pastor Masood and the team began to pray for him, the boy um, pointed at his mom, I believe it was, and said, Mom. Some of you need to take a diagnosis off of you. You need to take a label off of you. Some of you, you got this title on you, sex addict. Listen, on the cross, he became a sex addict so that in this life, you can be free and be pure of mind. So, so, your psychiatrist might call you that, but I can, I can promise you 120% that your Father in Heaven is not calling you that. And I really couldn't care less what your psychiatrist is calling you. I couldn't care less what your doctor is telling you. I want to know, what is the author and perfecter of my faith? What does my God have to say about this situation? What does my God have to say? I want to know what He has to say so I can declare His Word over my life. I want to know what he has to say so I can declare his word over your life. So that you, you should know what his word has to say so you can declare it over another brother or another sister. Because I can tell you, in the days that we are living, we need people that know what the word has to say so we can be speaking the word over each other. Amen. I remember I met with a really great pastor downtown Seattle. And the entire time, he was saying things that sounded great church-wise, but they weren't biblical. And I felt really bad because I, had, I kept having to stop him and say, well, that's not, that's not true. The Bible says you are the righteousness of Christ. Why are you talking about yourself that way? I love this introduction into the book of Revelation. Why? Because this is, this, it says this is who he is. This is what he has done. He has freed us from the power of sin speaking to a church that's facing imminent death and saying, and we'll read this in the weeks to come, in his hand are the keys to death and Hades. Amen. Hey, can I tell you what that means? That if you are in Christ, you, you, know, you, can, you, you know you can tell hell? No. Hell No. Hell no. Ah, uh, hell no. You're going to die. Ah, uh, hell no. You're a pervert. Ah, uh, hell no. Your husband's going to leave you. Ah, uh, hell no. I say no to hell. I say yes to heaven. Your kid's got ADD. Hell no. Kid's got autism. Hell no. Heaven, yes. Hell no. Well, th these are the facts. You don't... <laughs> You might know the facts, but you don't know the truth.
on his word we stand. And I'm not talking about the pages in your book. I'm talking about the real logos, the man, the man of fire. Jesus is the logos. He is the word. He is the beginning. He is the middle. He is the end. I'm talking about him. Stand up to your feet, if you will. Somebody said to me in the first service, they said, wow, this study of the book of Revelation has been far more optimistic than I was planning for. <laughs> Just hold out your hands. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would use these words to inspire courage, to fuel us with a fresh passion for Jesus, with a fresh passion for missions. Lord, that you would use this book, Lord, to, to bring us back to you and to take us away from the spirit of religion and performance-based holiness. We choose this morning to worship Christ and to worship him alone. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy to call ourselves slaves to his service. I will give up my personal liberties to be a son in the house of God. I will give up my preferences to be called a son in the Father's house. I will give up everything. I lay it all on this altar. I belong to him. I am my beloved's and he is mine and his banner over us is love. Father, I pray today, Lord, that hope would be restored, that joy would be restored, that relationships with Jesus would be restored. Um, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, okay, if you, if you don't know him, um, let's just all pray this together. Just say, I believe. <laughs> I have no other choice. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Son of God, the way, the truth, the life. I surrender my life to Him. I receive His Spirit. I receive His grace to live. I receive His grace to overcome. Can our, can our prayer ministry team come? If you need prayer today, if you feel alone, if you feel like you're in this battle all by yourself, okay, that is not the truth. You are not alone. You are not in this battle by yourself. If you feel that way, do not leave this service. Come to the front. We want to stand with you. We want to speak the truth over you. We want to pray with you. In fact, let's do this. Everybody on this side of the, of the church, point your fingers at all these people over here. Point at them and say, you are not alone. Everybody over here, point your fingers over at these guys and let them know, you, you are not, you are not alone. Okay. And then, if you're here, you're new to this house, see me in the hallway. I've got a book for you. I'll answer a question, give you a high five. Otherwise, you are loved. God bless you.